I recommend this practically for all women, is often we look for the perfect person. And that causes us to go into a bias towards looking at what the problem with this person rather than what's good about this person. And your objective is to create a series of positive dating experiences rather than find the right person for you. It's, it's If you were to visit my house, you'd see how beautiful home I have. But if you wanted to buy it, you'd actually hire somebody to see what's wrong with it. And that's what our brain does is we're in a searching for the right person too much. So I'd recommend, be, as a woman, be open to the men that are interested in you more than you're interested in them or equal. Try not to be with somebody where you're trying to please them, but they're actually more interested in pleasing you. Then you have a chance to try out these new skills of not being a people pleaser. And that's a whole other subject. That's why we have the book there, uh, Mars, Venus on a Date, and Beyond Mars and Venus, those are good dating skills. But the answer to that is practice. Let your first dating experiences or your later dating experiences, if you're starting over or you're still out there dating, stop looking for the right person and look for the person that makes you feel safe and not necessarily sexually aroused. Let that come as you increase your mental and emotional vulnerability. Then it's healthy to become and to listen to your physical vulnerability, which is your attraction to someone. So that's some good, concise advice. Yeah, and it almost seems a little bit counterintuitive in a way, I think, right? Uh, and and that yeah. leads, and it feels like, well, how do I find the right person if I'm not out there looking for the right person? It feels a little counterintuitive. Okay, so when I give me another example of this outside the dating thing, which is my daughter wanted a house, uh, a particular, she has all her, what the things she wants. She make a list of the things she wants. So you look at that. Then she started doing house shopping. And we looked together every Sunday. We looked, what is she like? What is she not like? And as she started to see more of what she liked, it became more clear to her what she enjoys the most and what she doesn't enjoy. But there was never this sense of I've already bought the house and I'm stuck with it. You you want to just create what's often called a yes set to create a series of yeses in your dating experience. But if you're looking for the perfect person that you no longer have to date anymore, (laughs) and dating is a drudgery because you're constantly disappointed sometimes, is you're looking to just create a positive dating experience. That's your goal. You know what you're looking for, but you're letting that refine what you like and what you don't like, what you like and what you don't like, what you like. And the don't like doesn't become you know, a real strong negative emotion because you haven't invested a lot in the relationship. So I don't know why it's paradoxical, but to me, it just seems like common sense is that don't push it and an experience. And one of the reasons why we tend to be attracted to the wrong people is because we have issues inside of us where uh, we're, we're trying to please people more than letting them please us. And our society so encourages women to be more masculine and not so much receptive. So you want to practice some of these skills that I teach of being receptive, letting a man do things for you and that feels without feeling obligated to do anything for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so powerful. And this ties in with another question that came in. I think this will tie in really well here. Um, Let's see. Um, Let me find it. Oh, here it is. Connie, she says, I would like to ask John about something I heard him say in one of your earlier interviews. This goes along with what you're just talking about, John. He talked about going for men that we don't feel attracted to. I feel confused by this because I want to feel attraction for a man. Can John help us understand more about what he means by this? Now, a large portion of women say to me, I had I went on a date, had sex with a guy, I never called back. If that's ever happened to you and you felt sexual attraction for a guy and you went on a date, whether you had sex or not, and he doesn't call back, then you have a message that when I feel sexually attracted to somebody, they're usually not available to me. It's a thing that we all have, which is we tend to desire more of that which is not available. And once we have something, we're now looking for something more. So when your intuition actually doesn't say in English to you, but you have a sort of a Geiger counter that says not available man, 
if that's the case where it's an unavailable man and you feel desire for them, then you have something needs to be healed inside of you, which I call daddy issues, where you didn't get enough love and support from your father or your mother didn't get it from your father. Then a part of you still wants to find daddy who's not available and get him to love you. And so what occurs later in life is that you tend to ha- almost in certain situations where a man is not available or dangerous or married, you feel more sexual attraction. And if you have that situation because of your life experience, then you have to choose to not date men that you want more than they want you. So I uh, see attraction can grow over time if there's a curiosity and a respect. So there's, if somebody makes you feel safe and they're interested in you, this is the ideal setting to practice being more feminine rather than pursuing men. And if you feel sexual attraction right away to a man, usually that is your body's subconscious response to win his attention. And that's what you don't want. You don't want to be in a place of trying to get more from him, but seeing if he gives you enough. And that's a receptive position. That's your feminine side. And that produces female hormones. But, you know, being on a date is kind of a fight or flight situation. It pushes women over to their male side where they try to please the guy as opposed to allowing him to please you and being authentic. And now we have the basic dating skills, which is first be naked mentally and see if you don't feel more attracted to him. And if you don't, then you go move on. But you want to be able to express who you are in your mind first without trying to change somebody. Now, that's I'm not saying just say whatever you think or feel, (laughs) because sometimes, you know, that could be offensive to somebody. It could sound controlling to someone. It could be argumentative to somebody. But express what you think. And particularly if it's a different, different from his thinking, it's fun to be different. It's the differences that create the attraction. But we, if, we're, if we're adjusting ourselves to win them over, then the attraction won't be there. So first, you want to go for curiosity, interest, admiration, respect, Uh, enjoying, that's the heart starting to open, having fun together, being open together, sharing your feelings together, Uh, then you become naked physically. Otherwise, don't rush it. And, And don't let your physical attraction guide you as a woman. Use your mind, find somebody who's safe, who seems reasonable, seems good, who likes you more. It may be a little boring, but give it a chance to grow. It's like a little ember, you put air on it and it starts to become a fire. Or it doesn't, but you at least had time to practice good relationship skills where you're not trying to win a guy over because so many women get into that. Yeah, this is so great. This is so great. You're clarifying this. So you're not, you're definitely not saying that we just settle for a relationship where there's no attraction. You're saying that sometimes those initial tinges or feelings of attraction can misguide us or be misleading or send us going off in the right direction. And that oftentimes it's these guys where it's more like a slow start that the attraction can grow with and can turn into a, a relationship that has that passion and attraction in it. Yeah. Another way of saying all of that is be friends first, but don't put them in the friend zone. It's a little tricky. Uh, don't treat them like a girlfriend and men have to learn not to be like a girlfriend. Uh, but find a place where you really like hanging out with somebody. You like having conversation with them. They're wonderful. But don't make him into a girlfriend by asking him a lot about his feelings. You see, once you start penetrating into a man, now you're bringing him into his female side and you won't feel the healthy attraction. He needs to be on his male side, which means he needs to hear you more than you need to hear him. Mm-hmm. So if, if a woman is asking a man a lot of questions about his feelings, that's, that's changing that energy and that dynamic and putting him more in the female side and her going into understanding more about him instead of him coming back and paying more attention and, and learning more about her. Nicely said. Right? Yes, absolutely. He, you should be talking a lot more than him. And you should make sure that you're not arguing when you talk. You know, you, you don't <laughs> want to be opinionated. It's just because see, what you want is to create a sense of different points of view are OK. We don't have to convince each other, but we can appreciate each other's points of view. I think it actually makes a relationship more more interesting 
when you're not exactly the same, when you can understand a different point of view and a different way of looking at things. I know there have been times with my husband in our marriage where I've been so convinced that I'm right about something, John, and then he'll say something. And I've learned from you. That makes sense. I tell him, I said, that makes sense. And I'm like, you know what? I hadn't really looked at it that way. And you are, you're bringing up some really excellent points there. And it's helping me to understand that from a, from a different perspective. And I was starting from the baseline of believing firmly that I was absolutely right. Yeah. We need to get off our position that everybody has to think the way we do. And not it. I like that you use the term interesting. One is finding interest and in, but more so for a woman that a guy is interested in your perspective and you be interested in his perspective and the way you can calm him down when you're different because men want to change women just as much as women want to change men there's no difference there it's just that what a man needs is for you to say something oh that's a good idea that makes sense all right you're right about that i like that you know, just be positive for that person. Give them what they need. Don't try to change them. And likewise, what you found, which I love, is you found that actually by doing that, you, you expanded your perspective and you feel a greater sense of connection with people of another point of view. By having the, the differences in a male and a female in a relationship or dating, oh my gosh, that's what builds the attraction on a physical level, but let it build up based upon feeling safe to open your mind, to hear somebody's point of view and still be attracted to them, to have them hear your point of view and he's still interested in you. you in a sense, you're kind of like testing, but really you're just being authentic. And then to start getting a little more, int little more intimate by sharing feelings. And feelings should not be misunderstood when I say that, not like, let's talk about the relationship and how you feel about me. <laughs> I can <don't> feel <laughs> right. that. that, that's dangerous territory. Don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> Sharing feelings is talking about your life in terms of not just what you think and what you believe, but it's like today at work, you know, I was so happy. I got to do this. That's a feeling. Or I was so disappointed. I thought this guy was going to do this and they didn't, but I know it's going to be okay. You know, you have to, when you share negative feelings about work or your life or your kids, you need to always buffer it with, and it's not a big deal. I just like to share it. You know, I can handle it. Otherwise, he's going to jump in there and try and solve your problems. Uh, but right. when you minimize the intensity of feelings by just saying it's not a big deal, but I was so upset, <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> Basically, you're saying it's not a big deal that you have to solve. Okay, that's your, it's another way of saying, look, I just need to talk about this. I don't need you to fix it or solve it. Because so many times women complain, and rightly so. You want to share what's going on inside, and a man jumps in there and says, well, you should feel this way. You shouldn't think that way. Well, why are you upset about that? That's not a big deal. You know, that's trying to change somebody. And women, you know how men have done that in the past, and it kind of shuts you down. Don't do that to him either. You know, just don't try to change his point of view. Don't argue with him. Practice learning how to appreciate, just as men have to practice how to be a little more empathetic to understanding when women's feelings come out to validate them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so powerful, so important. Uh, so this one says, um, this is from Annalise. She says, there is so much talk right now about emotionally unavailable men and even narcissism these days. These are terms I never really used to hear that much. Can you please ask Dr. Gray if he thinks this is really as prevalent as it seems from this? And if so, what we should watch out for? Okay, this is a due to... Uh it's all an illusion. Uh, we like to label things and make them worse. Okay. So when you see the emotionally unavailable man, it's, it's women who say that. And mm -hmm. basically it's emotionally unavailable women who are complaining that men are emotionally unavailable. Now this is 50 years. I'm telling you here, when a woman complains, he's not in touch with his feelings. She's not in touch with her feelings, except that she's dissatisfied but that's not even, she's not even feeling her vulnerability, her fear, her insecurities, her doubts, her worries, her feelings of inadequacy, her feelings of unworthiness. She doesn't feel safe to express who she is. And she doesn't even know what that looks like for many women. I mean, sometimes women just, they don't know how to connect deep inside. And so what they need, <clears throat> they, their soul says, you need to connect deep inside. 
And, and so she wants to go there. And so the mind says, well, if he's vulnerable, then I can be vulnerable. If he is, makes me feel safe, you know, if he can be sensitive and cry or open up or express affection and warmth, if he has all that, then she feels safe to open up herself. If she was to open up herself, she would experience more affection, more warmth, more caring from a man. If you ever seen a man with a puppy, you know, he, that puppy is vulnerable, a little baby, he'll hold it and be very delicate with it, whatever. He will be that because that's appropriate for the situation. But women today have become so tough, so independent, so not needing men that <clears throat> you don't pull out of the man that warmth. And it's basically because she's not expressing the openness for that warmth to get in. She's cold and she might have a smile on her face. She might be, oh, so giving and giving and giving, but she doesn't receive. She doesn't feel the part of her that needs help. So when a woman feels she needs help, what she finds is a man responds with great caring and response to various degrees. The more she opens up, the more he will respond to her by opening up into her. Meaning the idea is, is she wants him to be emotionally available. She's really saying, I want to know what's inside. I want to be reassured that what he's feeling inside is love for me. When she needs to open up and let him know what she, what she feels, so his attentiveness to what she feels will reassure her by its own action. Now, so we got all this role reversal going on. So that's the first thing. So I hear all the time about uh, an emotionally unavailable man. Here's the idea of it. Think of yourself. If you actually went to your mo emotions, you'd be very unstable. Emotions are unstable. They go up and down. Nobody disputes that every day we have ups and we have downs. And if you don't have ups and downs, you're really not emotionally available because emotions are waves. They go up and down. Life is a lot of little ups and downs or bigger ups and downs. It doesn't have to be big. It, ups and downs, ups and downs. And what you want from a man is not ups and downs. You want stability. What men, these... Emotionally unavailable men have tremendous potential to be great listeners, to be empathetic, to go out there and solve the problems. And the more deeply you open up, the more connection you will feel from him. Because what women are feeling is, I need connection, but he can't connect with you unless you open up. So that's the first thing, <clears throat> the emotionally unavailable man. The next is... <clears throat> The narcissist. Oh, I hear this all the time. It's mm -hmm. come this big, you know, as soon as a man does something that's not like a woman, he's a narcissist. You know, mm -hmm. a man goes to his cave. You know, I wrote that whole book on that men are from Mars. Men go to their caves. Now, there's millions of women who went, well, finally, I make sense of it. It's not like he just doesn't love me and doesn't care about me or he's unstable in his love. He just not in touch with his feelings right now. It's like there's a cloud in touch with his feelings but he's not having any feelings. You see, he's just blocking the sunshine. For women, when the cloud is blocking the sunshine, she has uh, numb, the, no feelings or negative feelings. For men, it's actually very healthy for him to disconnect from his emotional side to rebuild his testosterone. That's why men withdraw is primarily to rebuild their testosterone. And But when women withdraw, it's usually because she's feeling, I can't trust you. I don't want to open up to you. <laughs> I, I can't get what I need from you, so I have to do it myself. And so it's a sign of imbalance when a woman withdraws, uh, or generally speaking, she's upset with her partner, so she doesn't open up to him. Well, a man, he doesn't open up to you at times when he needs to rebuild his testosterone. It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with just his stress levels of the day, as I explained when men are feeling independent on my own, not needing you at all, not needing your love, not needing your reassurance, not needing your appreciation, we have to come back into ourself and rebuild our testosterone by swinging over to our testosterone side, which is the independent side. Now, I know this doesn't, if people haven't heard all the understandings of my, you know, understanding men need more testosterone, women need more estrogen, otherwise they're stressed out. This may not make sense, but the bottom line is men pull away in order to recover from the stress of the day. Women typically pull away when they feel overwhelmed, stressed. I can't get what I need from you. I, I withdraw from you. I don't want to talk to you. That's kind of like her punishment. I remember one time in the first year of my marriage with Bonnie, I came home and she wasn't talking at all. Oh, and, no. and I thought, and I thought, I guess this is what happens in marriage. They, she stops talking to me. And then I thought, 
I like it. <laughs> but she was, like she it. was, she was punishing me. She was saying, you, you have to realize you've done something wrong. And so I'm not talking to you. So if that's her experience, then if I'm not talking to her, she thinks I'm saying she did something wrong. And what did she do wrong? So now she gives more. And then I keep pulling away because of my own stress of not feeling appreciated by her because she's resenting me. Then she thinks I'm a narcissist. Oh, he just thinks about himself. And this whole the whole thing about narcissism is if you break down narcissism, it's people who think about themselves first. And you look at those commercials for the airplanes, put on your mask first, then put on the mask of others. That's take care of yourself before you can take care of somebody else. And you take that to an extreme, that's narcissism, where they don't end up taking care of somebody else, okay? <laughs> so, but a man takes care of himself, goes to his cave, it feels so good. If you don't let him know you need help, he won't come out of his cave. And so suddenly you think, oh, he's a narcissist. No, he's in a relationship with a woman who doesn't know ask, doesn't know how to ask for help, isn't emotionally available, and blames him because she thinks he's so selfish when he's not selfish at all. He just doesn't have a job to do where somebody will reward him with love. You have to learn to bring men out of their cave. And these are all arts of relationship. But if you if you know if he's in his cave and watching TV and you're taking care of the kids and doing all this stuff, you think, oh, he's so selfish. He only cares about himself. I said, no, he's doing what he needs to find balance. And men are much better at that than women. Rather than judge him for it, realize, you know, I need to start taking more me time and not resent him for it. And then, then you say, but I can't get me time because I have to do all these things. I go, no, you don't. You've got a guy over there that would help you if you just learned how to get your me time which is my daughter's course, how to get your me time, which is learning how to ask for help, how to not overgive, how not how to set boundaries, how to ask for help in a way that motivates men. How, this is like, you know, there's a whole art to relationships today. And men are not narcissistic as a general thing. I just hear it all the time. And when I actually meet the man, he's quite wonderful. I just see how the woman doesn't know how to use him. It's kind of like a software. You don't understand the software because it changed. If you look into history, what you'll see is that men were taught how to provide by culture. They taught us what women needed. And what did women need? They needed a man who was steady, not emotional, who would do his job and provide for the family. That was what they wanted, a selfless man who cared for his family. And that was a good, good thing. And women then appreciated him so much for that because they were pregnant and had babies. They needed someone to protect them in that way, provide for them in that way. And also culture didn't even allow them to do that. So they had to do that. So they made the best of it. And so when you depend on somebody for your money, for your food, for your livelihood, you appreciate them a lot. So women had so much love in their hearts that these men who knew their job was to be soldiers, policemen, workers, construction workers, down, down in the earth, dirty, dangerous, difficult jobs. We did it without complaining because we got so much love from women. And then when women were appreciating us, we were very kind and generous and sweet and loving to her. We're also tough. That's being both masculine and feminine. It's femininity in women that brings out his softness. Otherwise, he's going to appear to be narcissistic if you expect him to be like a woman. And he's not, you know, he's not there. And some men, the ones that, oh my gosh, are, in, are more on their female side, you might say they're more narcissistic because they get all demanding and whiny and complaining <laughs> and all that stuff. Uh, it's because he's way on his female side. And what can you do about it? I mean, this is tough. This is happening all over the place is you can't change him. All you can do is change yourself. And when you change yourself and start becoming more feminine and doing the things that waken up your feminine side in your relationships, it pulls out the best in men and they come back to their masculine side. You know, if there's a big fire, I could be sitting around the house watching TV, feeling uh, not motivated because I'm rich and I have plenty of food and gaining weight. <laughs> <laughs> and then suddenly there's a fire, boom, I'm going to come alive because I'm needed. You see all these women that complain to me, I'm divorced. And my, my husband, you know, he never took care of himself. He was very passive. You know, he didn't even, you know, buy new clothes. He didn't work out and, and, and or read help books, self-help books or anything. And so I, we, now that we're divorced, he's reading John Gray. He's reading your books. <laughs> He's, he's got a new <laughs> outfit. He got a haircut. He lost weight. He's exercising. He's come alive. 
And of course, she's mad at him. Why didn't he do that with me? And then, of course, deep inside, always underneath anger is fear that is there something wrong with me? And that brings her back to our deep feelings of unworthiness. All anger is just a defense reaction from a we feel we're bad. And so what's about why? Why not me? What went wrong? And why does she feel that way? This unwarranted unworthiness, unwarranted unworthiness, because she is worthy. She just doesn't know her mistakes in the relationships. Our relationships go down when people don't have the new skills because we've got this whole whole new software where that, that we don't know how to use. The old-fashioned software for relationships doesn't work. And you've got to go through this crazy learning curve. And thank goodness my books are there. The, the answers are there. You just have to read it and then you have to do what I say. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I just want to ask you, John, so if I understand you correctly, just to kind of like put the fine point on this here, yeah. in your, from your experience of many, many years, uh, you think this focus that is out there in the world right now on emotionally unavailable men and narcissism are exaggerated, first of all, if I heard you. Yes, right? yeah. Dramatically it's, exaggerated. It's exaggerated based upon misinterpretation of men. Okay. And also that if a woman has experienced uh, instances where she keeps finding that the men she's dating or the men she's getting to know appear to be emotionally unavailable to her, this could be a really good time for some introspection in terms of how emotionally available she really is. And, and one way to experiment with that would be to be more sharing of feelings not like you said, the feelings like, uh, you know, where is this going on the first date? But feelings about I'm excited about this or this made me happy or I had this experience and it brought me joy. And I call it kind of like a distinction between the resume or the factual stuff and the feeling stuff, the stuff that comes from the heart where a man can see a little bit more into a woman in terms of who she is, what lights her up, what excites her, what makes her happy or even what disappoints or frustrates her. Am I understanding this? I just want to like, uh, you know, you, you summarize. I love your summaries. They're so, so good. And I would actually, uh, for most women, I put emphasis on get in touch with what you're feeling that you don't reveal to other people. And that's usually what we don't reveal to other people or to ourselves is we try to avoid our negative emotions. So look at your lifestyle. If you overeat or you have any kind of addictive behaviors like addictive to complaining or addictive to eating, then those are dynamics that show you are avoiding what your feelings are deep down inside. And you can pretend you put a smile on your face and, and you're just in complete denial of what's going on inside of you. And that makes you very unattractive to men. And it makes you also un, unable to appreciate men because your feminine energy, feminine energy appreciates masculinity. Masculinity respects femininity. Heroes are people who respect those in need, those mm -hmm. soft part of life. That's who you are. If, if you're not appreciating men in your life, if you're not trusting men, you're not in touch fully with your female side. That's what the female side is. It's the part of you that can love and appreciate those who can take care of you, which would be the masculine energy supports us. And if you're not feeling I have I'm, I have people to support me. It's you have to work on your ability to be grateful is a good beginning. But see, the, the problem here is focusing just on the positive means for many people, you're going to deny even looking at the negative. <laughs> but the only reason we need to focus on positive is because we're we have so much negative we're not looking at. Because when you actually process your your negative emotions, you have suddenly a, uh, an ocean of positive feeling. And that's called being in love. And then your buttons get pushed. It triggers these unresolved issues inside of us, our confusions about misinterpretation in reality, believing lies and misinterpreting people and thinking they're wrong. All that stuff triggers negative emotions in us. We have to process our negative emotions and come back to love. And that is a big subject. You know, this is why you read these books. You know, I've exercised the feeling letter exercise is something you have to do. And you know, I, I keep putting this out there because I know for many people who aren't traumatized in their childhood, just understanding the differences between men and women can go a long way. But today, basically because we're all so much more free and independent, uh, 
these unresolved issues that usually stay unconscious are coming up. That's what's happening in the world today. When you have greater freedom to express yourself, which is what people are requiring today, then you behave like a child. <laughs> because you, The child could not fully express themselves. You look at somebody who becomes rich and famous, suddenly they start acting like a, a baby. You know, they tear up their bedroom, the rock stars, you know, they get so much love, make so much money, they go to their hotel room <laughs> and they destroy everything. They have fights and arguments and entitlement. You know, this is this is what, what's happening to people today as life gets better, and it is better in so many different ways. As we become more confident and capable as adults, then suddenly these feelings, we feel safe to be ourselves, and then everything unlike feeling, anything that you push down because you didn't feel safe to be yourself starts to come up. And what that looks like is different emotions. And because we're not emotionally intelligent, when we're upset, we always think somebody outside of us is causing it when they're just a trigger to be in touch with our own inabilities to love. So this is why I say you got to practice these skills. You got to get your buttons pushed. You got to know how to process your feelings. You not know how to treat the opposite sex. Come back to your feminine side. But processing emotions, negative emotions, is one big part of, of finding your vulnerability and your feminine side. Mm -hmm. So, so powerful. So I wanted to ask one last question before we leave this part of the interview, and that was um, about the about the men going into the cave, because, you know, this is something that women don't understand very well at all. And I know you explained it a little bit. He's got to go in there to rebuild testosterone. But for example, John, last night I got an email from a woman and she said, I met this guy. We started dating in two and a half weeks. We went on 10 dates. And then now all of a sudden he texted me once on Monday. Now this was only Wednesday that she's sending me the email because it was last night. Um, so it's only been a couple of days, but she says, and now, no, now he's gone. And we were, you know, seeing each other every day, sometimes twice a day. And so to me, that sounds like he's gone into the cave because that's pretty intense to go on 10 dates in two and a half weeks. Would you interpret it that way? Like, I just want to understand this and make yes, it really yes, tangible. Yes. So I'll tell you for women, only do one date a week for several months and you will build a relationship occasionally twice. That's it. What happens is when men get close to you, see, why does, why do I want to get inside of a woman? All right. I am so masculine. I'm testosterone man, so I'm too much testosterone. For me to find balance, I need to connect with femininity. Now, right now, I have a girlfriend, we have lots of sex, but she's in China right now. And what I end up doing is now I have a challenge by eating sweets. You know, I wanna eat cookies all the time. I don't, <laughs> but I wanna eat cookies. And I do eat some, and I'll lose weight as soon as she comes because she's the sweetness in my life. You see, that, that's the yin energy. Feminine energy is the sweetness. See, so, so basically, I'm looking to my cookies to give me that feeling of life is sweet because I can't connect with her. Men need femininity. And when they're strong men, they're on their male side, then it creates a desire to connect, particularly sexually, but also just do things for her, do things to make her happy, interact with her. And so she's happy. And so I get to experience my own female side by being close to her. And it feels so, so good because we need women to feel it. Then what happens and also be in our masculine. I don't need a woman to feel my female side if I give up my masculine. All I have to, if I stop doing things and just watch TV, I can, I can be on my female side, but I'll become weaker and weaker and things will get more and more boring. So what I need is to be in my masculine side and have the opportunity to now also feel feminine. And that's what sex is on a physical level is I get to be hard and feel softness all around me. Uh, you know, this is the connection. So a man desires a woman to connect with his female side. And what happening, what's happening hormonally is his testosterone is up, but to find balance, he wants his estrogen to rise up now. That's the emotional side of us. So as the estrogen level starts to go up, it feels really good. He enjoys it. He's having a good time. This is fun. I love it. I'm consumed with it. Now the estrogen goes too high. And when estrogen goes too high, testosterone goes down. And it can go down very suddenly. It just simply just knocks down. Then what happens is he associates with her low testosterone and disappears 
because you didn't give them a chance to bond with you slowly and surely. It just has to be a gradual bonding where he can dip in there, experience, oh, this feels really good. And now he pulls away, his testosterone rebuilds, he's ready to go in again, his testosterone rebuilds. And this is gradual bonding because what happens and every woman's experiences, almost every woman, every woman I've talked to, is that they have sex with a guy and then afterwards he turns over and pulls away. There's like this disconnection that happens. And that's normal for most men because it's a time to rebuild their testosterone. Now, the secret here, just to get biological, it's more about ejaculation because I can have sex every day because I've learned how to have orgasms without ejaculating. But when men, you're, most men, and almost always all men, unless they learn these particular skills, uh, I'm thinking of Liam Nelson, which says, I'm a man with particular skills. <laughs> and I, I have particular skills. I also teach them to men, but it takes a long time to learn. It's, a, it's an art. But you, if you ejaculate, when a man ejaculates, it's his estrogen level going too high, which then causes his testosterone to go too low. So then he has a recovery period where he comes back. He withdraws. Now, some men say, oh, I can withdraw, but come right back and come back back. And I say, well, that's because you're addicted to sex and your estrogen level doesn't go so high. But when a guy's, you know, really excited meeting a woman, he can recover very quickly because as he's getting to know her and enjoy her, the association with her is increasing estrogen, increasing estrogen. And he keeps ejaculating uh, if you have all this sex all that time. And that just lowers his testosterone more and more. So the research shows that a guy can have sex on Saturday night and then uh, have sex two days later, actually have sex on Saturday night. And on Sunday morning, his testosterone will be half what it normally is, uh, half of what it was the day before. Then it will stay low for about six days. On the seventh day, if he doesn't ejaculate, it will double. But if he has sex and two days later, he has sex again, his testosterone and two days later, he has sex again his testosterone levels are gonna stay low, 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 and start getting lower and lower until he's not interested in you, as opposed to letting him bond with you uh, and have this great experience and then miss you. And that's what I call the rubber band theory mm-hmm. in my book, Mars Venus, where he gets close, his estrogen goes up, his testosterone goes down, he needs to detach, pull away, his testosterone level recovers and he springs back like a rubber band. So he gets close, he pulls back, he gets close, he pulls back. And what women have to learn is not to pursue and not to, not to engage in his addiction to his pleasure, which is what he's experiencing during those days together. And she's probably addicted to it as, as well during that time. She sort of puts her life on hold and just entertains him or is entertained by him and you disconnect from the rest of your life. You don't stop your life just because you meet a new guy. You let him slowly become a part of your life. Don't rush it. Yeah, and don't chase him into the cave, right? Once he goes to his cave or he pulls back like the rubber band, don't pursue him because then he has to keep pulling back more and more and more. Mm -hmm. So for women that are dating a man and it feels like he goes into the cave, uh, it's it is a temptation so many times for women to like want to reach out or text him or do whatever you know we think we're being really subtle but he's totally on to what we're doing I think um, no no I, I think it's okay to just say hi uh, just thinking about you I just went to so and so and just put as long as it's, it's as long as it's not a, a a shaming moment or a demanding moment or a requirement for him to respond. You can also do, you know, no need to respond, but I just wanted to share this with you. I heard a funny joke or, you know, I just watched this show. It was amazing. You might enjoy it, but no need to respond. If you say no need to respond, you'll get more responses. I love it. I love it. So the idea is it's okay to do something like that, but not in a way where you're saying like, what happened to you? You disappeared or something that sounds like you're mad or upset or shaming or really needy. Exactly. You hit all the right words there. Okay, perfect. (laughs) All right. Let's see. Um, This one. One other thing. One other thing I wanted to say with that. This is the feeling of it. If you've ever been in a relationship where your partner says to you, I love you. And and it would be 
inappropriate to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't feel very good, right? <laughs> no, no. It's, just, it's, it's setting the person up to, to be a good person, but it may be not what they feel like saying at that time. So they feel manipulated and controlled. And now they have an experience of you of trying to control them, which is nobody wants to be controlled. Right, right. And so if, he, if a man's feeling controlled, he's going to pull back even further or always, feeling like always. you're trying to control, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Now, this one's kind of an interesting one, John. This is from Rachel. She said, I recently met a man. I'm excited to hear what you say about this. I recently met a man who told me right off the bat during general dating conversation that he loved it when a woman cooked for him, gave him back rubs, and just generally did, st did stuff for him. I'm confused as to how to proceed after that because John says not to give too much, but to allow the man to give to you. Now, I'm sure that ideally both partners give to each other once you're in a relationship. But in the beginning, how should you proceed if you're dealing with a man who says this? Is he simply trying to use me? Is he a less masculine type male? What? <laughs> That's a great question, don't you think? It's, it's a great question. It, it's one of my objections to... Uh, Dr. Chapman, who I admire greatly. He's a wonderful human being and he wrote the book, Five Love Languages. And he just doesn't, I, at least in his books, he doesn't talk about gender differences. I don't think he's against them. But in terms of the love languages, one of the love languages is someone who does things for me, right? Right. So you, you found a guy who read the book. He read the book, Love Languages. So I want you to know I'm into the love language, do things for me. If a man ever says that to you, what you should say is, woman, that's great. I am too. I like it as well. That's the answer for it. Okay. There's nothing wrong with doing things for a guy as long as he's doing a little more for you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> and and that, that's the problem with that book. And, you know, the book is like kind of same thing as Men Are From Mars. It's the revelation that people are different and we need to find out what they need most. Now you add to that gender, a lot of people think what they need most, actually a man who thinks he needs a, this neck rubs and a woman who cooks for him, you know, this is, uh, it, it, there's nothing wrong with that, but he says, that's my need and what's your need? And she says, well, I need it all. <laughs> I need affection, <laughs> gifts of love, reassurance, <laughs> you know, there's all of those things. Women need it all. And if they don't, that's a problem for them. And men need it all, but to not as it, to not as great extent. What men need is to feel successful in in what they do in providing that for her. That's the real need. But he's in touch with his female side. He likes neck rubs. He likes somebody to cook for him. And hey, that's not a problem if she likes to cook and maybe she likes to give neck rubs. That's not a problem. But it's a it's a tricky thing when when men think, okay, what I need is is action to serve me because that's basically what all female side needs the most is action to serve me think about the whole history of mankind the cooking thing however is a little different in that if you love to cook that's not a problem if you have if you're home and you're raising children you'd be cooking anyway so why not cook for him but when you don't have children around that you you naturally feel uh, an instinct when you're a mother and you have time and resources, you want to nourish them. Your breast feeds them. Cooking is actually a very nourishing thing, unless you've got issues with it. Uh, it, it, it can be very, very relaxing for women to do cooking because uh, nourishing others is very feminine. So it helps her produce female hormones through cooking. That can be, unless she doesn't want to, then it's not going to produce female hormones. But uh, when, when I married Bonnie, I said, actually, I never said, I, I, I want you to cook for me. She just said she was happy to cook for me. And I told her that anytime she wants me to cook for her, I will do that. I'll take you out to the restaurant. <laughs> or I'll, or I'll go and get takeout. Because I told her there's no requirement. You don't have to cook. But I have to say, I, I, part of my preference in picking Bonnie was that she loved to cook and she was a good cook. And that was wonderful. Her, her complaint to me is that, I didn't care that much about food because <laughs> I've been a monk. I, I, even now, I only eat one meal a day. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of transcendent when it comes to needing food. Unless my girlfriend's not here, unless my wife's not here because she passed on, I need the sweetness from a woman. And if I don't get it, then I will eat a little too much. Uh-huh. Yeah. Hence the cookie craving, right? <laughs> hence the cookie craving. 
Cookies right. produce sweetness produces estrogen. And uh, but it's also anything that makes you feel dependent, it produces estrogen. And uh, when women are too far on their male side and they don't have relationship skills to produce their estrogen, then they all often have addiction to food. Yeah. Yeah. So the key here, again, just to kind of like put the exclamation point on what you said is it's not that it's inappropriate for a woman to give in a relationship and a healthy relationship has giving on both sides, but there needs to be that reciprocity. And if I'm hearing you right in the beginning stages, early stages of a relationship, the man doing a little more. Definitely. And you're never going to have exact. So air on the err on the side women of giving less and receiving more should always be that's the direction you lean in so we all want to be giving here's the dynamic this is male female actually giving to get giving to get is masculine giving in response to receiving is feminine Ooh, okay that's so this, a, that's a gem right there it's a gem right there you know men provide to get love that's it we do that to get, we all need love and we need money. So I go to work to get money. A woman goes to work to get money. She's producing testosterone. Nothing wrong with it. I'm giving to get, you know, I do counseling because people pay me. I don't do counseling if people don't pay me. You know, that's my job. So I give to get. What does a husband do? I give my wife everything because I want to get love. And if I don't get love, then that natural instinct starts to close down in men. Now, part of my thing is, you know, if it starts to close down, then you realize you're expecting too much. You need to give yourself what you need. Then you open your heart again. And then as a man, you go give to get. So you have to know all the formulas of how to actually get love from a woman. Men don't know what women really need. So they, <laughs> they feel no matter what I do, it doesn't make her happy. She doesn't love me. And I go, that's because what you're doing is completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. <laughs> now, for women, while, while women don't, you know, that, that's a part of women is their masculinity. They need the skills and the tools. But one of the mistakes women make is their tendency is they know how good it feels to give. It feels good to give, but it only feels good to give when you are have received so much. See, that's generous. Oh, I feel I have so much. I want to overflow. So you're giving back that actually that giving back is not a giving to get. When you give to get, you're making testosterone. When you give because you have so much to give or you're giving back because you receive so much, primarily the hormone that gets produced is a blend of progesterone and estrogen. And that is most important for women to produce in their body in that 12 days after their period. That's when they're making both progesterone and estrogen. Estrogen is I'm receiving. And then progesterone is I've received. So now I want to give back. But as soon as she goes into I haven't received. And so I'm now giving to get you to love me. Her body is making testosterone. And it's what's interesting, her body makes, every woman makes testosterone out of their progesterone. So she becomes progesterone deficient. And then she experiences something called estrogen dominance, which generally occurs between ovulation and her period, those 12 days. And she has PMS and, and dissatisfaction during that time. That's usually often, she can feel very needy because she thinks I need more estrogen at a time when her body wants to receive and give more. So it's very important that during the period from her est from the end of her period to ovulation, that's when she needs to primarily receive more, receive more, receive more, and not give so much at all. Just appreciate, ask for help, do things for herself, enjoy her life, not so much feel pressure to give to anybody. Then after ovulation is where she will feel, oh, I've received so much. Now I want to give. And so giving from receiving is going to produce both estrogen and progesterone, which is a blend that needs to dominate, needs to dominate. Still, she can you know, do that on the way up towards ovulation. But the primary thing for romance, for example, is doubling her estrogen, which is having a man do a lot of stuff for her, which is why you mentioned in the dating, primarily the man is doing stuff for her. 
once she's receiving so much, she can start giving back. But that's that's her control to keep her to keep her from feeling resentful because resentment will be automatic. Just like if I punch somebody, they'll bruise. If you give more than you receive, you'll start bruising and it takes time to heal a bruise. And you, the first step is you have to stop bruising yourself. <laughs> you have to stop overgiving and now start giving to yourself, not looking to somebody else to get love from them. But you can give love freely to children. That's because they always give you unconditional love so much you're giving back to them. That's why nurturing is very feminine, but actually it's, it's giving back. When you nurture a child, it's they give you so much unconditional love. You just, it just pours out of you. Mm -hmm. And then after menopause, uh, women still, in order to maintain healthy estrogen levels, still need to be in that mode of receptivity and doing things to support their healthy estrogen levels. Because I yeah, know we yeah. have, we know, you know, we have a lot of women a little older here who are no yeah. longer cycling. Right. So the same, you won't, you don't have as much of the concrete biological uh, strong cycling, but it's still happening on smaller levels, on smaller levels. Uh, you need to experience a balance in your life. Think about this. I need to have a balance in my life as I get older, a feeling I'm getting what I need. And then I'm also giving back what I'm getting. And it's so easy as you get older, when you don't have these hormones to at least help to control you, uh, you don't have that. But by that time, ideally, you would have learned how to receive. So now when you're giving to others, you're giving from a place that I've learned how to receive. So I'm receiving and giving. So your hormones aren't so much controlling you, but you're controlling their production more naturally your hormones will control you at a younger age if you're in harmony with them. But right now, unfortunately, our, uh, our culture is just telling women, you know, you're inadequate if you're not achieving and accomplishing and what's wrong with you. And if you're feminine, you're weak and needy and you shouldn't depend on anybody for anything. You can do it yourself. Otherwise you're not lovable. That's the message the culture's saying. It's telling all men that you're not good enough. You know, Bill Gates has got all the money and what happened to you? You know, he was just a kid. Why did he, you know, it's always this, uh, that culture is always saying you need more. You're not good enough. You should have more and you don't have it. So what's wrong with you? We all feel this message of dissatisfaction that we're being conditioned to feel. It's not who we are. We are, we are abundant. We are lovable. We have just everything we need. If we look around, it's there. We're just not looking at it because we're just rejecting what we have. Not, not enough, not enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think I know we've talked about this um, receiving these this receptivity, John, before. And I think that one thing I think women often miss is how satisfying it can be for a man to be able to provide something, to be able to give something, to add something to a woman's life and have her receive. And I like to call it graciously receiving because she's receiving, but she's also acknowledging and appreciating him for that. So he gets that positive reinforcement, which I believe helps him to feel that masculine kind of energy that helps create and foster attraction. Absolutely, everything you said is completely accurate. And I'll give you another example of graciously receiving. I like that phrase is, uh, you know, Bonnie drives different from me. And so when I see a yellow light, I run through it. I speed up. And when she sees a yellow light, she stops. <laughs> That's just who she is. That's her comfort zone. And my comfort zone is speeding up. So when I'm in the car with her and there's a yellow light, I stop. And I put my hand on her thigh and I say, honey, I did that for you. Wow. And she says, I know. She says, I know. And I appreciate it. So you see what she's saying in that I know and I appreciate it is I know that that's not your comfort zone and you're doing that as a gift to me. And I really appreciate that. That makes me feel special. As opposed to a woman who's not aware of these different needs and ways of interacting, she might go, well, you shouldn't run through a yellow light. My way is the right way. That's how you should drive. <laughs> or she go, here's another example. I call this taking your partner for granted. And women do this and men do it in other ways. But women do it from the point of view of, of uh, feeling, well, I give you so much you should give me. Instead of like, regardless of how much I give you, what you do for me is a truly gift that you care and you want to share that. This isn't a business deal. This is you care about me. So what I do 
isn't the reason why you give to me. The reason you give to me is because you care about me. You respect me. You love me. You want to please me. Not because I've done things for you, but because that's the place you want to come to. That's called not taking your partner for granted. And that's what people have so much passion in the beginning of relationships. One of the reasons from one perspective is because we have no require, we don't have any of that taking each other for granted. Like, well, you should take me out on a date. You know, I made you dinner last night. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 should, you should buy me flowers. I do your laundry, you know, <laughs> just the, all that shit stuff that comes from scorekeeping. And yet at the same time, biologically, we do keep score. When a man does a lot of little things for a woman, showing consideration, caring, listening, uh, uh, giving hugs, uh, giving her help in different ways, being a good listener, all these things I just mentioned, men don't know are so important because they don't make money. And, but they actually make estrogen. So you can give her the 50 roses, you'll get the same surge of estrogen as you would get with one rose. If she has low estrogen, you can give 50 roses and it doesn't do anything. You can give one rose, it doesn't do anything. Each has does about the same amount. But if a woman has normal estrogen levels, you give her 50 roses, there's going to be a nice surge of estrogen. One rose will do the trick as well. So do lots of little things. Now men start to get a reason why, you know, things are not so great in his relationship is because he thinks one big thing should, you know, be a thousand points. And really every act of love, big or small, is one point, one surge of estrogen. Yeah, and I think it kind of goes along with the idea of, a woman who says, well, I need my husband to tell me I, that he loves me every single day. And the man's going, well, I told her I loved her. Nothing has changed. Right. It kind of right. goes along right. with that. Well, that, that's how the man takes her for granted. He okay. thinks, well, I did that already. Well, I did that. Already. Why do I have to do it again? I'm doing the big stuff. And he doesn't understand little stuff is very, very important. And one of the primary emotional needs of women, meaning a need for that produces estrogen is reassurance that she's special, you know, and I need reassurance that I'm successful. It's just a different reassurance. You know, I'm, in, I'm invested in the stock market right now. I look every day to see how my stocks are doing. I'm not going to sell them. I'm in really good stocks that I'm in. And, but I still want to go, did I, did I lose anything? Did I make anything? I'm <laughs> looking for reassurance as wow, what a great investor I am. You know, when I, when my books were all on the bestseller list, I'd look every Sunday. I wanted to see, I'm still number one. I'm still number one. and not that feel good? That's me looking for reassurance that I'm a success. Everybody, if you're for your masculine side, wants to feel acknowledged for your success, your competence, your capability. And your feminine side wants to be acknowledged as I'm important and I'm special. And I'm lovable and I'm worthy and all those good things. I'm a good person. And you see that and you want to love that. And you want to, and I need help. I need support. And you're there for me. See, I had a, a woman write to me today on one of the shows I did, my Facebook show, and her question was, uh, oh, what was her question? Now I forgot it. Anyway, we'll, keep, we'll stay on subject here. We got your questions. We'll stick with that. Okay. So this one I wanted to bring up because I wanted to bring to the attention of this audience um, a question that was written in about your book, Mars, Venus on a Date, which, by the way, John, I recommend to my coaching clients. And one of my coaching clients, we were having a um, conversation the other day, and she said, oh, she said, these five stages that John talks about, these stages of dating that John talks about in this book, she said, this gave me so much, this has given me so much clarity. So, so here's a related question from Monica. She says, hi, John, thanks for taking our questions. In your book, Mars, Venus on a Date, you talk about the stages of dating. And I'm wondering if this is something to discuss with someone I am dating. If that's the first question, if a man consciously chooses to move through the stages of uh, through the stages with a woman or if it is something that just naturally happens. You know, everybody's a little bit different. You know, it'd be like, you know, some guys are like, hey, let's read this book together and and check this out. And, and you know, it's different temperaments like that structure. Uh, in most cases, it's just going to be if a woman reads the book, she's aware of the pitfalls of every stage and how to make sure it's happening and to kind of know where she is as the relationship is unfolding. 
I think that the more heartfelt we are, the more mature we are, and you can move through those stages very, very quickly because you have a, you already have a sense of who you are. You know, for me, I'll give an example. After 34 years of marriage with Bonnie, uh, you know, I know who I am and I know all my buttons that can be pushed. I know how to let them all go. So for me to start a new relationship, you know, I gave myself a year to grieve and I said, okay, now I'll start a relationship and boom, I found the person. And I don't, I don't have all those doubts and questions because I know who I am. I know what I want. I know just what I want. And I found it right away. I mean, it's just like my friends say, how are you doing? I said, oh, I'm having a great life. And how do you find that? Yes. Well, I'm a relationship expert. You know, I should. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you know who you are, you know, uh, and, and you, you see what happens when our buttons get pushed, we get upset and then we become judgmental or critical or doubtful of others. When you know who you are, you find the right person right away because they will mirror who you are and you love who you are. So you will love them. But that's, you know, I'm, I've been doing this 50 years, almost 70 years old and personal growth is my thing. So it's very easy for me now to do all this stuff only because I've been doing it for so long. So having said that, having said that, uh, what is my, what is the, the question here? Remind me of the question. The is question when, is, are the stages of dating, is it something to discuss? Oh, is it something natural? Man? Okay. Yeah. Love at first sight, for example, you know, you might be right when you have love at first sight and, and that can happen. That's just feeling strong attraction or it's a real soul knowing. Uh, it's not that common, but it can happen. Uh, you know, my kids, Bonnie, I think in our last year that we were talking a lot about our relationship to kids and, and one of my daughters said to Bonnie, did you know that dad was the one when you first right away? And Bonnie said, the first time I saw him, I know he was the one. Really? And, and then they said to me, dad, did you feel that? I said, I said, she's the one I want to have sex with tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's an honest response. <laughs> yes. Actually, I didn't say sex with the kids. I said, she's the one, I, she's the person I want to spend the night with. <laughs> so that's what I knew. But ironically, even though we had such a beautiful connection right away, we ended up breaking up. And it wasn't until I got married to somebody else, learned a lot of lessons, made a lot of mistakes, did some healing. And then came back knowing she was the one. So, and she she was the one. She still is the one in my heart. So there's this thing we have to recognize that I can share from my own experience is you could be with your soulmate and not know you're with your soulmate because you're not ready for them. You haven't grown enough to recognize the one. You don't love yourself enough to, to actually stay with somebody who truly loves you, who's right for you. Because, you know, not all of our thinking is correct and we're down on ourselves, hard on ourselves, doubting ourselves. So back to the question. I'm just trying to answer questions today. So the, the question is, so do you go through those stages? Mainly you go through them being aware of where you are in the whole thing without trying to explain to where your partner is in the whole thing. But the third stage, first is attraction, then comes doubting, then comes commitment, then comes deeper intimacy. Your stuff comes up and you're able to overcome it. Then comes proposal. And then you act as if you're married, but without all the pressures of being married, then you get married. So that's them in short. And every stage has its own challenges. So the one I'll talk about right now that you do need to you know, clearly talk about. The others, you just need to understand and act appropriately rather than make the common mistakes people make. But when it gets the commitment, that's where you need to discuss that I'm not willing uh, to be physically intimate with you until we get to know each other enough to where I know that you're committed to me and you're not going to be having sex with other people if I'm having sex with you. Because you should, in my opinion, it's extremely confusing for a woman mm -hmm. and not confusing for a man, but subconsciously confusing for him. He doesn't know when he's confused or not, but <laughs> he, he'll just feel like, I don't know if I want to be with her, you know, <laughs> and then uh, I don't know what went wrong, you know, what I'm ready to move on. He doesn't, He's just sort of lost in, in the whole thing. Women will often feel confused. You know, they feel like, I, I don't know. Is he right? Is he wrong? Is he wrong? Does he love me? Does he? That's when you want to all talk about the relationship. But there's a place where he wants to have sex with you and you go, you know, I want to have sex with you. But I know for me, you're talking, I'm being the woman here. For me, 
it just doesn't work for me to have sex if I if if the man I'm having sex with is having sex with anybody else. So I want to feel that as long as we're having sex together, that we have a a commitment and a promise to each other that we're not going to have sex with the, with other people. And in the beginning, I still need to go really slow with it. I don't want to have a whole lot of sex. I mean, I want to, but I know that I, I need to have it just occasionally, maybe like once a week, where it generally works for me. And but I also need to feel that you're not having sex with anybody else in between or that you're not having sex with yourself. Uh, that's really what works for me. I like to feel that the energy is building up. Now, that's pretty bold to say. He may not agree to that, but that's you really want a relationship. That's why I tell women, find a guy who wants you more than you want him, and he'll be willing to play by your rules. Uh, but if you're trying to please a guy, you're going to be afraid to even say something like that. And it really is kind of weird today to say something like that, I'll grant it, but I'm trying to popularize this research that shows that if men have sex, if men ejaculate more than once a week, they lose interest in the woman they're having sex with and are more interested in other women. And that's what causes us to become so confused is we, you know, we start to compare. As soon as a man's testosterone levels go down, a woman's estrogen levels go down, that means she's in a little stress state Whenever we're in stress, we always start comparing and comparing is the thief of our happiness. There's always better on the other side of the fence, you know, if you're feeling stressed. If you're not feeling stressed and you understand that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence is actually what you become when you're stressed, then you don't pay much attention to that and you focus on the good that you have. But that takes maturity. And that's why there's stages of this whole thing, because you, before you even get to that level, you have to have deep intimacy where you know yourself and you're able to share yourself with your partner. So that's where your stage four is where your partner triggers you and you have all these uh, you know, judgments or disapproval or arguments that come up and you're able to di dissipate them very quickly by taking responsibility for going deeper and recognizing how you contribute to problems rather than them being the problem. You are responsible for how you feel. And that's the deep intimacy that you start to experience. You overcome that. Now you wake up one morning and you go, he's the one for me. Because you've connected with your soul through the relationship. Then you can see if they're your soulmate or not. And sometimes you get to that level of intimacy and they're not the one for you. You love them, but you realize they're not right for you. And that's okay too. How do you know if somebody's right, really right for you as a soulmate? Your heart has to be fully open. So how do you know if somebody's not right for you? Your heart has to be fully open because when your heart's open, it's not like they opened your heart. You opened your heart in relationship to them and were able to know if they're the one that you want to share your life with. They could be the one you want to grow in love with for a while and move on. It, there's, no, there's no just because you love someone, you have to spend your life with them or they're the right person for you. But if you open your heart, then you know. Knowing is something that comes to us when our heart is open. And it's just no reasons even. There may be reasons that help you open your heart, but knowing is a knowing. Like if I have a cold glass of water, refreshing glass of water, I know it's cold. It's just a knowing. Well, we all have that capacity when our heart is open. But in our relationships, when you use negativity to get what you want, you're not connected to your soul. The soul uses love to get what you want. And when you use negativity, basically you're lying because you're not negative. You're a positive being. And it's a, it's a partial truth. It's what you feel, but it's not the complete truth. You know, you can be angry with somebody and go, oh, I'm angry about you. But now I realize that, you know, you didn't mean to say that or you really do care. So I'll let it go. So I care about you. So now you, you've, you've gotten to the complete truth, which is, yes, I was angry, but now it's an incomplete belief or feeling. It needs to get back to love. And then it's forgiveness. And that's the, that's the total truth. We want to learn how to get to the real truth of life. And that's by getting to the truth of who we are, which is we're loving human beings, but we do interdepend on each other. We're dependent. We need love. We need support. We need to be loving. Otherwise we're not being our true self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was beautifully said. And, you know, coming back just for a second to the five stages in your book, which by the way, everyone, I really highly recommend um, the stages in your book, when I thought back on this, when my husband and I were dating, and one of the distinctions, because I didn't get married till I was 43, so I dated a lot of different people, 
And I, I didn't have the easiest time finding what felt like the right relationship for me, which is part of the reason I do the work that I do, because I'm really passionate about how good that can be when you find the right person um, and how hard it can feel when you don't have the right person. And yeah. so um, but one of the things I noticed was that with my husband and I, we never discussed, you know, the stages of dating or anything like that. But things just felt like they naturally, gracefully progressed in a way where it didn't feel like there was struggle it didn't feel like there was drama and it just felt like the relationship just like naturally it wasn't push me pull me one person way into it more than the other naturally and gracefully evolved and yet when I look in the book I can see you know I can see how yep that's what was happening then that's what's happening then we were naturally and gracefully moving through those stages and I do think your uh your wisdom about some of the pitfalls to watch out for since a lot of the women are out there dating is so incredibly valuable. Yeah. So you answered the question better than me, but it, having heard what you just said, it, it, the answer is I, I came up with those five stages because you can see that people who get married, have good relationships all went through them. And I can see at the, it's a natural unfoldment of the stages of a plant developing. For example, it goes through stages and it's not like you're saying, okay, now we're gonna we're gonna force this stage and we're gonna force this stage. It's a natural unfoldment of typically what happens when people bond and the bonding grows. At the same time, what I did is said, be aware of what stage you're in, then you know what your challenges are. You also know what your pitfalls are so that you don't fall into them. Because like in the stage of commitment, often one of the pitfalls there is men have a tendency to say, okay, now that we're having sex, I don't have to work so hard <laughs> to make you love me. And so they, they tend to become a bit more passive and a woman will tend to feel like, oh, he's becoming passive. I should work harder. You know, now that we're in a committed relationship, I'll give more in the relationship. And by giving more, he ends up going further the other direction. So that would be a pitfall in that situation that you want to look out for. And, and so many people naturally move through them and they're able to overcome those pitfalls and people that don't end up happily married or if that's their goal, they don't, uh, they don't make it because they hit one of those pitfalls and did made a mistake. And so here's how you can correctly evaluate what's going on at, from, from, a, from a wisdom point of view rather than falling into the pitfalls. So I point those out. Yeah, yeah, it's really a wonderful book. And I, I also am just learning um, more and more about some of the things you're teaching in um, Beyond Mars Venus. And a lot of the hormonal things are making a lot more sense to me going deeper with some of this too. So we recommend John's books. And John, I want to be respectful of your time because I know you have another interview today. But I do want to give you a chance to leave us the last word here. Keep in mind that many singles are wishing to be in a relationship and many people who are married are wishing to be single again. <laughs> so our, <laughs> our, our suffering is really something that we create inside ourselves. And as we gain more wisdom and knowledge, we begin to realize we can, we can find the love that we deserve and you will get it. Particularly, you know, as you're reaching out today, I know you continue to reach out for new knowledge to recognize how you contribute to the problems in the past in your relationships. And each time you come back to love, you become clearer in your ability to attract the right person for you, to know who's the right person for you and have the skills to keep them the right person for you, if that's possible. So it's a real, real pleasure to spend time with you and to do these interviews. Well, thank you so much, John. And thank you so much for your generosity and for being willing to field all of these questions. And you're so generous with your wisdom. And I really love what you've shared because I know that your work is making such an impact in the world. And for this audience, we're really honored and we want to express our gratitude and appreciation for your generosity. It really means a lot. You're very, very welcome. Thank you so much. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.